This is EE3720, week 6, lecture 3. So today we're going to be refining our root locus sketch by introducing three additional rules uh, to go with the rules that we discussed last time. So recall what we have is this basic idea again. that there is a root locus criterion for determining the poles of our closed loop system that is the trajectory if you will of the poles of our closed loop system by a simple relationship okay so this is number one and uh, also recall that the example we were using was this one and I'm going to use different colors like I used in last lecture but you should realize that this implies that the root locus uh, gives or the root locus that we derived negative 2 is a zero, finite 0 three finite poles we had this branch and we had two zeros at infinity we did determine the asymptotes there were two asymptotes but what we didn't and we also applied ideas like symmetry symmetry about the real axis whoa it's a bad branch ah it's so hard to draw like lines on this tablet So symmetry about the real axis, the number of branches for the root locus is 3. But we'll, let's start out by finding what is called this breakaway point. That is the point at which uh, the root locus breaks away, real axis break away, or break in, so where it breaks away from the real axis, or breaks in, to the real axis breaking points so the idea is very simple that basically we know from one that equation one that k is simply negative one that is on the right hand side of equation one we have negative one over k which k is negative one over gsp times hsp but this implies that when we look at points on the real axis where we break away and break in so with respect to a real number sigma when we are breaking away that sigma is maximum when we are breaking in that sigma is going to be minimum that is as we crank up k so we're going to look at k as a function of sigma so a real number, so sigma belongs to the real numbers. So on real axis, make it even clearer. So we have that, but this implies that when you're breaking away, that's the maximum sigma we can get. So dkd sigma at sigma break away or break in is going to be zero so the justification is that at break away or break in so break away within brackets break in negative 1 over g sigma h sigma is going oops
to be maximum but at break in it is going to be minimum so with respect to k So that is, we have defined k as a function of negative 1 over g sigma h sigma. Let me make that clear that we have k as a function of sigma. So for our example, k as a function of sigma is going to be negative 1 over sigma plus 3, sigma plus 4, sigma plus 5, over sigma plus 2. So let me save this. So this implies we have to take the derivative symbolically. If you want, I mean, you can. So this is using symbolic. Uh, so TI-89. If you, for example, you could do that, or you could just say, you could just use the quotient rule, which is the denominator squared, denominator, and there's a negative sign floating around, times derivative of the numerator, so let me use the expand functionality on my calculator, which I just did before this lecture commenced. Whoops, I want to flex on it. So what I got was denominator squared times de denominator, de denominator squared, uh, denominator times derivative of the numerator. So the derivative of the expanded, um, there's a negative sign here. gives me 3 sigma squared plus 24 sigma plus 47 minus numerator times derivative of the denominator. Derivative of the denominator is 1. The numerator is this expanded term I got, which is sigma cubed plus 12 sigma squared plus 47 sigma plus 60. Okay? Now we set it equal to zero, so we solve this. So the numerator is obviously equal to zero. So when we solve this using our calculator, uh, we basically get uh, not C solve, solve because we're looking for reals. Sigma is approximately. negative 3.35, negative 4.53, or actually there's one more, it's a cubic actually, negative 1.12, but obviously, but based on our basic sketch, and this is important in the sense all these methods should be used, I mean, any method should be used logically, but you should have an understanding that there is no way the breakaway point is outside the interval negative 5 comma 4. So based on our sketch, uh, sigma breakaway is approximately negative 4.53. And if you let's, I've kept the, my last lecture, I kept this open. So if you noticed the pole location here, there it is. So you can see it's like negative 4.5 right there. You just saw that the pole location was negative 4.53. I hope you solved it. I mean, you saw it there, negative 4.53. And you can also ask, um, what's its name? Scissor tool, what it is. But very, very close, right? So a very nice method. I, I like this method. But there is another method. compute breakaway or break in points uh, called the transition method Uh, this is not an, in my opinion, this is not a very elegant method. I 
It's just a formula. Uh, it's not an argument. They would as compared. To the derivative method, uh, so I won't cover this further. But you're welcome to read the appropriate section in your book and use it. But you are welcome to read the appropriate and use it, okay? So anyway, it's a very nice, the derivative method is really, really nice for computing real axis breakaway or break-in points. Now the second refinement to the root locus is J omega axis crossings, and you may not like this, but basically, you can use the Routh-Horowitz criterion. Now, for our example, there are no J omega axis crossings. Let's just make sure of that. It will be a good review of Routh-Horowitz. So let's see. I think this was the system. So this implies, again, like expanding it out. I've already expanded this out. Uh, that is the denominator um, uh, polynomial for the last uh, refinement rule. So basically, if I use that, I think I got s cubed plus 12s squared plus 47s, but I have a k times s here. So it's going to be k plus 47s plus I had a 60, but then I have a 2k plus 60 is 0. So the route array is s cubed, s squared, s to the 1, s to the 0, 1, 12, 2k plus 60. Now again, I can simplify this, divide by 2, that gives me a 6, that's gone. This gives me a 30. So b1 simply becomes, let's see, negative determinant 1, 6k plus 47k plus 30 over 6. Sorry. So let's see, this becomes, let me try to just write it here. So this becomes negative k plus 30 minus 6k minus 282 over 6. So this will become a negative 5k, negative 252. So it will become 5k plus 252 over 6. And you can see that this, I mean, this is zero. But now you can see that for a J omega axis crossings, uh, there should be, so if you want all the poles in the left half plane, there should be no sign changes in the first column. And there is no way, if K is positive, we're going to have sign changes, right? In the sense, the last row here is simply going to become, let's see, I claim it's K plus 30. Therefore, oh, let me see. doesn't crash, uh-oh. Damn it. All right, time to pause the lecture and get back. Okay, continuing. I had to rewrite a lot of the document, but that's okay. So where we stopped was the fact that if you want to have J omega axis crossings, we need sign chains in the first column. And for our system here, that implies K has to be negative, which is not possible. Uh, so, and that we know that, right? Because there were there were no J omega axis crossings for our sketch. So again, this confirms it very nicely. The final uh, criterion for us is going to be angles. Oops. Of departure from a complex pole and angle of arrival 
to a complex zero. And the rule is, I mean, the justification also is that from one, simply use the angle criterion. And for us, we are, for our example, we don't have any complex poles or zeros, complex conjugates. So let's look at example 8.6 on page 409. It's a solved example from your book. So you can refer to it when necessary. But I'll, I'll try to do it slightly differently. But let's see. S plus 3 times S squared plus 2S plus 2. So here's our system. So basically, the root locus criterion, so let's just write that out. So root locus criterion gives us that SP plus 2 over SP plus 3 times SP squared plus, whoops, 2SP plus 2 equals 1 over k at a phase angle of 2k plus 1 pi. But now you can see that in this sketch, that if we start sketching the root locus, we have a pole at minus 2, but we have a pair of complex conjugate poles right here. Let's see, it's at minus 1 plus or minus 2j. Minus 1, here is plus 2j, so we have a pole there and a corresponding conjugate pole over here at minus 2j, and we also have another pole at negative 3, so we'll have one real axis segment that goes like this. So, but then the question now is how does the root locus start from these complex conjugate poles? And this final rule for refining the sketch is helpful because you can suppose the uh, root locus goes something like this. Then you know that there are no j omega axis crossings and you don't have to apply the Routhorowitz criterion to check. I mean, you could, uh, sorry, you could apply the Routhorowitz criterion to check, but you don't need to use it to find a value of k for the j omega axis crossings. Number one. Number two, this rule is very simple to apply in the sense, let's now consider, uh, that is, so consider an epsilon very close to, let's say, minus 1 plus 2j. You could do minus 1 minus 2j as well, but just consider a point right there. And we know that there is a theta from the, I can't draw it, it's very hard. There's a theta from the pole itself, let's call it theta u, theta unknown. But we know, now this one's very simple in the sense, uh, this uh, theta, let's see, this is theta 1, let's call this theta 2, this theta 3, so theta 3 is approximately 90 degrees, because no matter where this point is, it's very close to this, so it's going to be 90 degrees, and theta 1 is going to be the inverse tangent of uh, opposite side over hypotenuse, which is approximately uh, let's see, let me I'll use my calculator, 63.43 degrees, and theta 2 is going to be exactly equal to actually inverse tangent of 1, which is 45 degrees. Therefore, theta 1 minus theta unknown plus theta 2 plus theta 3 must be 180 degrees. So I get theta unknown as approximately 108 degrees. So this actually implies that we don't have any j omega crossings. Therefore, because the real axis is imaginary axis, this is minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. So here it is. Bear with me for a 
couple of more minutes. I know the lecture is going a little longer than 20 minutes. Sorry about that. Okay, so basically you're going to come out at an angle of 180 degrees from this pole. So by symmetry, you're going to come out at an angle like this. So now this implies that your root locus might do this. Okay, but then let's look at the asymptote. So again, we're using this rule to guide us to that's the thing, right? With the root locus technique as a concluding points to as concluding points to this lecture, use all these rules as guides to sketching the root locus. In the sense, understand what rule you have to apply. So let's look at our asymptotes rule. So sigma finite poles minus sigma finite zeros divided by number of finite poles. This was covered in last lecture, minus number of finite zeros. Let me save so you don't lose any of it like I did last time. Hopefully it, it saves. This Windows journal is being very annoying. Uh, come on, please save. There. So this one, number of finite poles, uh, let's see. We have minus 3, minus, uh, so sum plus negative 1 plus 2j plus minus 1 minus 2j minus the finite 0 at negative 2 over 3 minus 1. Notice we have two finite, in, sorry, two infinite zeros. That's where these poles are heading towards. So this will become these cancel. So it's minus 2 plus 2. So you basically get this as negative 1.5. Aha! So there's an asymptote right there. And if you look at the angle criterion, I claim that the angle of the asymptote is going to be pi over 2 minus pi over 2. You should check this. But anyway, you have it at negative 1.5. So you have two asymptotes. And you should also check this answer in MATLAB. So basically, your root locus segment simply goes like this. So there is no j omega axis crossings per se. There are none, so there it is. Okay. The angle of departure of 108 degrees. Okay, so that, this wasn't too bad. So now what you should do is you should go and practice, all right? Starting their homework problems. And practice, practice, practice uh, makes you really good at this. And trust me, this is the core idea for even, I would even say for like uh, body plots and other control system design techniques. All right, I'll see you next lecture and sorry for going three minutes over.